Ed Orgeron had a pretty bizarre press conference the other day. It's the middle of spring. You don't expect it. It happens when you least suspect it. But there were some comments that Ed Orgeron made Tuesday that raised both of my eyebrows. And I wasn't alone there. But there weren't quite as many people who noticed it, I guess, for lack of a better term, as I thought there would be. Which goes back to a principle we've talked about on this show before. And that is sometimes you have to divorce yourself from the tone or the personality or the backdrop, whether figurative or literal, of a press conference or a statement being made, and you just have to take the statement for what it is. So I'm going to do something here that we know we don't really play a lot of sound bites, sods, sound on tape is what it stands for. But we're not going to we're not going to play a long clip here. But I do want to play the clip because I want you to listen for yourself. And from Ed Orgeron's mouth, I want you to hear these words, and then you and I will react together. So let's roll it, and then we'll react afterwards. First of all, I think we did a great job at hiring the coaches and uh, doing a great job of uh, interviewing them. I, I hired some coaches. I didn't even interview them uh, last, from the last staff, and I'm never doing that again. I, hired, uh, I interviewed everybody. Uh, we didn't get the first, second. I, I'll tell you what, we got them on, on offense. I'm happy with them. I talked to Joe about him. I interviewed him. I told him exactly what I want. They have the answers. They're very smart. I couldn't be more pleased with him. You know, Durante was like the fourth or fifth choice. Well, so was I. Who cares? He's here. He's doing a tremendous job. Andre Card, I'm so excited about him. The D-line coach Blake is doing a tremendous job. And DJ and, uh, and Jake are doing a great job. So I'm very pleased with our offense uh, and very pleased with our defense. And, you know, obviously Coach Mack, I like him. I trust our staff. You know, I said to myself, I'm not going to let things slip by, not one thing. I'm, I'm identify it, and I told the coaches. And they might think nothing's good enough, but I'm going to be hands-on. I'm watching every piece of film. I'm marking it down just like I did in the years before. They're going to have to explain to me what the, what are we doing. I almost cussed there. What are we doing, how are we doing it, and why are we doing it. And they understand that. They, they, you know, they say, yes, sir. i got a staff that's going to listen. we got a veteran team coming back. We got 33 guys that have started opposed to the year before. So there's a lot of differences this year. That doesn't mean it's going to make a difference, but I expect to have a good team this year. Okay, so there it is. Let's let it breathe. Let's let it sizzle. Let's react. There's a chance. I think you gathered this by listening. There's a chance if you just had that playing. Let's say you were watching it live on Tuesday when it happened, and you're kind of you're about your business, you know, washing the dishes or whatever, and you were kind of passively listening. I could see how that would go totally under your radar. And it would sound like just another coach's voice at another press conference after another spring practice, and you wouldn't really make much of it. However, when we start breaking it down, there was a lot said there. There are red flags all over the place, blatant red flags that, as I tweeted out the other day, I think are only covered up by this really thin layer of icing. And that icing is made up of passion, and personality, because there's no doubt, before we break this thing down on a granular level, there is no doubt about the passion Ed Orgeron has there. There's no doubt about his willingness to try and commit to getting it right. I don't question any of that. But passion alone does not win you football games. Passion alone doesn't even qualify you to be a head coach. If it did, then you'd have 100-plus thousand folks every Saturday in Baton Rouge who are qualified to be roaming sidelines, actually leading the team instead of merely cheering for the team. So here's what I want to do. I want to revisit this, and let's just pretend, instead of listening, let's just pretend we're reading the words off a transcript. You don't know whose mouth it came out of. You don't, you don't see it. You don't hear it. You just read it. I think if you read it like a court testimony, this stuff really stands out. Let me preface. I love LSU. You guys know that. You guys know my, my affinity for the program. So that's the backdrop with which these words are coming out of my mouth. The first thing that caught my ears was when he said, you know, I had coaches on this staff last year that I hired, but I never even interviewed them. That was, um, that was a baseball bat to the face to me. I rewound it about three or four times to make sure I didn't miss anything. I, I even went and listened to the full press conference so I could gather the context. So I was making triple sure that we weren't just being misled and it wasn't some clickbait stuff. It wasn't. Everything I just showed you there, we edited it down for time, was a direct representation of what Ed, or what, what Ed Orgeron said about the hiring process. I want you to think about that now. Ed Orgeron's being paid eight and a half or so million dollars a year and just openly admitted to you, I hired people on the staff last year. I didn't even interview them. That, I, I don't know what in the world he was doing, but he wasn't interviewing people on his staff. He's not talking about grad assistants. 
He's not talking about off-field analysts. We're talking about people who either are coordinators or position coaches, and there they are on the sideline coaching every day at practice, coaching for LSU. I mean, the hopes of the 2020 squad ultimately rest on their shoulders. We haven't even interviewed them. Like I, that, that boggled my mind when I heard that. And secondly, I have a theory as to why that probably was. What I think is, and this was a mistake, but what I think was Ed Orgeron believed coming out of 2019, they had cast the mold and it was just in place forever at LSU. And then what he thought to himself is, since we have the mold here already, you know, since we have what other successful programs have, we can just plug anyone in here. It's a plug and go situation right now. So if I can afford to be selective and I can plug any kind of football man into this mold, I'm going to go find people who mirror my personality type. And he didn't like Dave Aranda's personality, but he loves the personality of a guy like Bo Pelini, for example. And so you plug guys like Bo Pelini in. Well, the problem is he was a terrible fit. And the reason I have further confirmation, at least confirmation bias on this, is because Ed Orgeron went out of his way before a game was ever played. He went out of his way during the fall of last year to talk about how improved they already were defensively. Of course, there was no evidence that they were improved because as games played out, we found out the defense was terrible. So there was definitely no evidence that he could have seen in practice that was actually indicating they had upgraded from Dave Aranda. He just wanted to say it. Number one, because he wanted to dig into the side of Dave Aranda. But number two, I guess he wanted his own confirmation bias. And so I believe he mistakenly thought the mold's already cast here. We can put whoever we want to in these coaching chairs, and it'll work. Well, no, no, you can't do that, and no, it didn't work. The second little tidbit I took out of this was him admitting that Durante Jones, their new defensive coordinator there, was his fourth or fifth choice. He said, yeah, Durante is my fourth or fifth choice. Who cares? Well, um, if it's that irrelevant, I, I probably, little word to the wise, wouldn't bring it up. I especially wouldn't publicize that. I want anyone out there, LSU or otherwise, Ed himself or otherwise, can anyone tell me any benefit to publicizing something like that? Because Director Colin and I can't find it. Uh, we can't find it anywhere. I have not spoken to someone yet who gave me a justifiable reason for why Ed Orgeron would feel the need to tell you the dude I hired wasn't my first choice. Second, nope. Third, nope. Maybe fourth, maybe fifth. I don't know. Do we understand who's listening to this? Well, number one, Durante Jones is. Now, he got hired, so he's thankful regardless. But I'm a recruit. I'm listening to that. I'm on the current roster. I'm listening to that. And it doesn't really matter so much when everything's going right. This is another theme I'm about to bring back up a little bit later on. It doesn't matter when things are going right. But imagine if you get into the season and we have very mixed results. And let's say I'm not where I want to be necessarily on the depth chart. Let's say I'm running with the twos at outside linebacker instead of the ones. And I, I don't like it. I don't agree with it. And so I start to form some divisions in that locker room. Well, here's my ammunition. The ammunition I'm using is Coach O himself said in the spring, this dude wasn't his first choice or the second or third. So Mr. Backup option over here is defensive coordinator is the one who doesn't think I should be starting. Well, maybe if he would have hired the guy that was number one or number two on his list, I would be starting because maybe the right coach in here would realize my value and my worth. All of this stuff is on the table in a normal setting. It's especially on the table when you publicize the fact that I didn't really get the coaches in here I wanted to, so I got the ones that I had to settle for. Not good. I don't see any way that works out well. But number three, and even after all of what we've talked about so far, number three is probably the biggest deal to me. Because the other two are kind of in the past, I guess, so to speak. Number three, though, is in the future. And number three was where he said, I'm going to be really hands-on with every aspect of this program. That's not Ed Orgeron's wheelhouse. Never has been. I don't think it ever will be. And so I know that you could play devil's advocate here. So devil's advocate would say, well, he should be hands-on. He's the head coach. It's his program. And if you'll listen closely, he didn't say he was going to interfere in the offensive meetings. He didn't say he was going to interfere in defensive installation. What he said was he's going to demand accountability. He's going to demand to know why things are being done. And he's just going to want an accurate and a meaningful accounting of how the program is operating. That's great. That's what every head coach should do. However, if you don't have a master tactician X's and O's type coach, which Ed Orgeron isn't, then typically what you want them to be is a really, really good CEO type, okay? That is how I would qualify Ed Orgeron, kind of the same way that Dabo built things at Clemson. 
He didn't really specialize in being a master tactician on one side of the ball or the other, but he was a great leader, and he put the right tacticians in place to run uh, the appropriate aspects of his team. Well, now Ed Orgeron says, I'm going to be a little bit more hands-on here. Okay, coaches have done that before, and they've succeeded. And the devil's advocates out there may be right. Maybe he just wants to make sure he has an accurate accounting of everything that's going on. And as long as they're winning, I don't think there'll be an issue. The question always arises here. Anytime that you start to feel like a coach is meddling in areas of the program that he really shouldn't, it happens when things are going sideways a little ways. And that's what could happen with LSU. Think about, again, possible scenario as we get into the season here. Instead of starting out 5-0, and let's say they've started 2-2 two and two and they got a big week coming up where they're struggling to stay above 500. Well, at that point, all of a sudden you're in the offensive meetings. And everything's not working. you got an offensive coordinator over here. You're, you're hired, and he's explaining to you the why, but all of a sudden you're saying, well, that's not working. So then we got to do things differently. Well, that's when the meddling starts. And it kind of happens in degrees. But all of a sudden you got a coach who is really in over his skis, but, hey, it's his program, and he's in kind of defense mechanism mode anyway. That's where things go sideways really quickly. So I would love for us to get to October or November, LSU is in contention for the SEC West, and we can pull this clip up and we can laugh at it together and it's really overblown. I'd love to be able to do that, but I'd be lying to you if I didn't say I had some concerns about this.